Thank you for joining us bright and early on a Friday morning. Um, I'm Susan DeReagan, and I'm Senior Technical Consultant at UL, Underwriters Laboratories. Um, two of my colleagues are here, Haley Sprague and Kayla Culp. Um, we have UL. Many of you may be familiar with UL, um, with the UL mark on electrical products. UL also has a consumer products group that does testing of all other types of consumer products, and that's the group that we belong to. We have been involved in the promotional products industry for about 10 years now, and we're uh, PPPC's uh, preferred supplier. So we do the product testing of the promotional products. And today we're going to focus on Canada's product safety regulations. A lot of them fall under this um, Consumer Product Safety Act. That's kind of an umbrella regulation that went into effect in 2011, and it applies to most consumer products. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the CCPSA and what it means to you. It reminds me a little bit of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act in that it is an overarching regulation requiring only safe product to be distributed and it places a lot of responsibilities on everyone in the supply chain from the manufacturer to the distributor to the retailer. So we'll go into some details on that. And then we're going to talk about the product safety requirements for specific promotional product categories and those are listed here. I, um, as we go along, we're a small group, feel free to ask questions. Um, I did want to ask you all, do you distribute um, primarily in Canada? Do you also distribute in the U.S.? Canada. Okay, we will focus on that then. So as I mentioned, the Canada Consumer Product Safety Act went into effect in 2011, and the overall purpose is to protect the public. Um, by preventing dangers to human health and safety that are posed by consumer products. And a consumer product really is anything that may be distributed or sold to the consumer um, for non-commercial purposes. And with regards to the danger to human health and safety, I think it's important to note that it focuses on not just um, existing hazards, but if there's potential hazards. And that can really be a challenge to identify if there's a potential hazard to a product. And we'll talk a little bit about the foreseeable use and foreseeable and unintended misuse of the product. So under this Umbrella Act, there are various regulations a lot of regulations for all types of consumer products. Um, I've included in bold the ones we're going to talk about, the ones that may affect the consumer products, the promotional products that you distribute. So we'll talk about jewelry, we'll talk about toys, um, we'll talk about the textile flammability, we'll talk about the ceramic wear. Um, but there's, it's important to note, there's just a lot of regulations under the Act that help the regulations help identify what specific things you need to look for for a specific product to meet that overall goal of protecting the public. A lot of those regulations, too, used to be covered in the Hazardous Products Act, which was essentially superseded by this um, Canada Consumer Product Safety Act. So who's responsible? Really, it's everyone. So you have responsibility if you're manufacturing a consumer product. And manufacturing means really if you're producing it, if you're formulating it, if you're repacking it. So if you're taking blanks and then adding logos to it, you're a manufacturer. If you're reconditioning it. If you're importing a product into Canada. If you're selling a consumer product. And Selling, in this case, means if you're distributing it. So it doesn't matter if there's money, an exchange of money involved. If you're distributing a product, like a promotional product, um, you're selling it. If you're testing a consumer product or if you're packaging or labeling a consumer product. So really everyone in the supply chain has some responsibility for ensuring that the product is safe for consumers and is compliant with the applicable regulations. 
and really, a safe product is a benefit to everybody. Um, the, the CCPSA, it's a mouthful, really enhanced the authority of Health Canada. It gave them additional um, powers to enforce compliance. Um, so the government is, is part of a key partner in the CCPSA in ensuring safe product. But industry has new obligations. There's record keeping requirements, there's reporting requirements, traceability throughout the supply chain. Um, and consumers have a responsibility to report if there's an unsafe product, if they're concerned about the potential health and safety um, related to a product. And so overall, the goal is for safer consumer products, greater consumer confidence in what they're buying on the market, um, and really just better protection for everybody. And as important, it brought the Canadian regulations and the Health Canada Authority more in line with, they say, international trading partners, but like the Consumer Product Safety Commission in the U.S. and others globally. So I mentioned that the CCPSA essentially um, supersedes the Hazardous Products Act. And the Hazardous Products Act was in place for many years. It prohibits and restricts the advertising um, and sale of hazardous products. But when you're comparing it to the current legislation, the CCPSA, really the, the Hazardous Products Act was more reactive. It would ban something if there was an issue with it. Um, whereas the CCPSA, PSA is looking at potential hazards. It's being more proactive in identifying trends and potential hazards. Um, the Hazardous Products Act really relied on voluntary action, whereas now with this new legislation, Health Canada has the authority to require mandatory actions of recalled products. There's a lot more um, teeth to what Health Canada can do now with this act. So let's look at some of the key elements of the Consumer Product Safety Act. Health Canada now does have that ability to recall product if they deem it to be unsafe. They can require corrective actions, which could involve um, reworking the product, stopping sale, recalling the product. Um, there, it requires now traceability. Where's the product from? What other product may be affected? buy it. Because if you're looking even just at a component of a product, if you're making a lid for a drinking bottle and that's all you're making is that component, but if a problem arises from that lid, say it has that pop top, you know, and it detaches easily and it presents a choking hazard, you need to know where it was made so you can make corrective actions at the manufacturing facility, but also who you sold it to and what other products could be affected aside from the one that may have been involved in a, a customer complaint. Um, Health Canada does have the ability to require testing. And this is a key difference. Um, in the United States, it's mandatory to test children's products. Where in Health Canada, it's not mandatory to test, but compliance is mandatory. And so testing is a very good way of ensuring compliance. Um, but Health Canada does have the ability also now to require testing. Um, there's increased fines and penalties for non-compliant product for failure to report to Health Canada. And the CCPSA also includes this new general prohibition um, provision which was essentially adopted from the Hazardous Products Act. And so certain items are just banned. So for example, lawn darts, banned. Um, polycarbonate in baby bottles. Um, Yo-yo water balls. These are items that are banned and again were adopted from the Hazardous Products Act. So with regards to recalls and corrective actions, suppliers can voluntarily um, take appropriate corrective actions. If, they, if you get a consumer complaint on a product or somehow otherwise learn of a potential hazard of the product, 
voluntary action is, is recommended. You can um, take the product, you can stop sale, you can rework it, you can notify the persons who you sold it to. Um, it's really a responsible business practice to help ensure that any unsafe product comes off the market and out of consumers' hands. Um, but then again, Health Canada may order that corrective action. They may order you to stop selling, to stop importing, to recall a product. We've seen a lot of joint recalls between Health Canada and the CPSC, um, which is wonderful. If there's product in both territories, you need to recall it in both territories. And this is really a significant change because prior to this act, Health Canada could not mandate a recall. And under the act, there is mandatory record keeping. We talked about that briefly. But really, it means that you have to have traceability throughout the supply chain. So retailers have to maintain certain records. They have to know where they got the product from. They have to know where the product was sold and the period of time when it was sold. The suppliers and the manufacturers need to know who they bought the product from, who made the product, and who they sold it to. Um, the requirement is that these types of records be kept for a period of six years, which is a little different. Europe requires 10 years, the U.S. requires five years, Canada requires six years. But it's important to have those records and to have them readily available, ideally kept in a place of business in Canada for products sold in Canada. And really the purpose of this record keeping is not just to create paperwork, but to ensure that you can have more efficient product recalls should that be required. So we mentioned another big um, factor in the CCPSA is that there's now mandatory reporting requirements. Anytime there's an incident about safety, potential hazards related to a consumer product, you need to report it. Doesn't mean you're going to recall it. You just need to report it to Health Canada. And it's very valuable that they get these types of reports because it can help them identify trends, emerging hazards. Um, you know, I wish we had had that years ago. There were some incidents um, related to facial suffocation. And it ended up um, where it was like 2000 there were some pokeballs, which were like half sphere balls that fit completely over the mouth and nose of infants and actually resulted in two deaths. If we had had this type of mandatory reporting for any consumer product, we would have known that years ago there were similar incidents on those legs pantyhose containers. Do you guys remember those? Um, there were similar com consumer complaints but that information was just filed somewhere and it wasn't really all connected. There was also an issue with a, a earlier toy, a bluebird toy, where again, the same thing, it, cl it closed over the nose and mouth and caused suffocation. And if we had had this type of record keeping back then, those deaths may not even have happened. It would have been identified as a trend and a product hazard. Um, so again, it's not necessarily um, a recallable situation, but it's important to report so that, you know, you may have an incident with your product, but there could be five other companies who are having similar types of incidents on similar types of products. Um, and in this act, what a reportable incident is, is really a very broad category, um, but the act does provide guidelines. So the first question to ask yourself is, is this customer complaint or reported incident um, related to a consumer product that I sell or import into Canada? Does it meet the criteria of an incident? And we'll talk about that criteria on the next slide. Um, but again, this, this is not just a final consumer product. It could be components, it could be parts, it could be accessories. So it could be a component like that bottle lid we talked about. And does it indicate that there's an unreasonable hazard posed by the normal and foreseeable use of the product or the foreseeable misuse? Um, so something like if a consumer complains that they 
stepped on a product that was left on the stairs and fell down the stairs. That is not a reportable incident because it's not a fault of the product itself. Um, but if you look at misuse of a product, something like those magnet desk toys, remember those like buckyball type of toys? Um, it was foreseeable that kids would find them fun to play with because they are, were, they're now banned, but they were fun to play with. And kids were even using them, older children, as like tongue rings because they would stick. They, they were so strong, they would stick on either side of the tongue. So they're using it as tongue rings, you know, nose rings. Um, that could be considered a foreseeable misuse of the product, and that would be a reportable incident. So Health Canada provides these guidelines on the criteria of what is a reportable incident. And it's important to note, too, that the occurrence doesn't have to happen just in Canada. If you're selling the same product in Canada and the U.S. and Mexico, and you get a report outside of Canada that a consumer was injured or felt they could be injured by the product, you need to report it. Um, if there's a defect that might reasonably be expected to result in an individual's death or other serious adverse effects, you need to report it. So that could be like a flaw in the design. Um, for example, there have been incidents of overheating with a product, a battery-operated product, where if you insert the battery incorrectly, it still works, but it, it throws off the circuitry and it results in overheating. So that's a flaw in the product design. You can make it so that it doesn't work if the battery's inserted incorrectly. Um, it could be something to do with an inconsistency in manufacturing. If, if you're screwing a component to the final product and maybe some shorter screws get mixed in with the appropriate screws, you could have that component detaching. That would be um, a defect in the product and should be reported if it, if it can cause an um, injury. If there's insufficient information on the package, so this could be like if, if you forgot to include a cautionary statement, such as keep out of reach of children. Um, if you are showing unsafe practices on the product, so if you're selling a beater and you, and you have a picture of someone licking the batter off the beater and, and the mixer still plugged in, that's an unsafe um, action. So you don't want to do that. We had, um, with the slip and slides, do you guys remember those? With the water? They were showing adults on the slip and slide. That's an unsafe practice because adults were like fracturing their necks on it. It's, so um, that's also something that could cause you to have to report. And then, of course, if the product's recalled elsewhere. Yes, sir. You, that, that's a really good question because pet products, the pet toys, are not regulated under this act or really under any regulation. Um, you know, pet food is, but the pet toys. And yet some of those pet toys look like children's toys, don't they? Our recommendation has been to test it as a toy because it is certainly foreseeable that that little stuffed mouse that the cat is, it's intended as a cat toy, a child may play with it too. So we have been recommending testing a pet toy as a children's toy, if it's something that looks like a children's toy. A rawhide bone would not, you know. I think with pet toys too, you need to be careful on the packaging to only show the pet playing with the toy and not the child playing with the toy. So we're looking at normal use and foreseeable misuse um, for the event to be considered a reportable incident. Uh, and you look at, you know, you have an intended use of the product, but depending on the consumer who's using the product, they could certainly be using it in unintended ways, like the magnet example with the, the teenagers using them as tongue rings. Um, so this can be a challenge to look at what constitutes normal or foreseeable use. Health Canada has used an example of juggling chainsaws. 
you would certainly be injured juggling chainsaws, but that is neither the intended use of the product or really a foreseeable use. Who is going to do that? Um, but you need to look at alternate uses of a product. <laughs> it's Health Canada. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Isn't there a commercial, too, <laughs> where some guy was going to juggle chainsaws? I can do it. I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express or something. <laughs> um, but another example is lighters. Sometimes lighters are made to look like toys. And if, if they're made to look like toys, it's foreseeable that a child is going to want to play with it. And that's why there's very strict requirements for lighters. Um, in the US, there's a saferproducts.gov website where consumers can report complaints. And that can be really interesting to read just to help understand how consumers are using and misusing the products. Um, when it first came out, there were a lot of incidents with those um, fitness shoes that are supposed to help firm you, and people were tripping with them. And the company came back and said, well, you're, it says right here you're only supposed to use them for X period of time. Well it is certainly foreseeable that a consumer is going to wear them all day. You know, so that, that's a foreseeable misuse of the product and you need to make it so that it's not going to cause injury to the to consumer. Sorry, what's, what's it's safer products, so all one word, dot gov, G-O-V. And you can search by company, you can search by product category, and it's just really fascinating to see how, what consumers are complaining about and how they're using and misusing products. So we talked about what you need to report. So when do you have to report? It's interesting that um, under this act, everybody has a responsibility to report. So the consumer, needs to report if there's a, a product hazard. And they need to notify the seller of the reportable incident. That seller needs to report within two days to Health Canada. And they also have to report the incident not just to Health Canada, but to the person who received the product, the distributor. Then the distributor, once he's notified, he has to also report to Health Canada. Health Canada expects everybody in the supply chain to provide information on the product. And the distributor also needs to notify um, the person who they sold it to. So again, this is why traceability is so important. Everybody has an obligation to report. Um, once the importer or the manufacturer of the product is notified of the incident, they also have to report within two days, but they also have a more detailed written report that's required within 10 days. Um, Health Canada is very strict about this um, reporting time period, and they've actually provided this table in the Act that can give guidelines on when you need to report. There's a web-based tool for reporting, um, and it, so it has to include information about the incident, about the product, about any products um, that could have the same type of injury, and what you plan on doing to it. Um, ideally, you can include photos. You can advise any corrective actions that you plan to take based on the incident. Um, and. That web-based report can also be sent to the next person in the chain so they can just add on to it or modify it based on their responsibility in the supply chain. And I mentioned before, testing's not mandatory. The suppliers are responsible to ensure that they're safe product. Testing is a good way to confirm if, if the products meet the requirements. Um, but there's no specific mandatory requirements for testing. There's no specific mandatory requirements for the laboratories that perform the testing. But the testing has to be done to the Canadian requirements, and we're going to go into those very soon. The testing has to be done on a sample or samples that are truly representative of what's going to be distributed in Canada. And it should be carried out um, at a laboratory that has the ISO 17025 accreditation. That's a technical competency accreditation that all laboratories should have for the specific tests that they perform. It's a test-by-test -test accreditation. 
In the U.S., as I mentioned, testing is mandatory for children's products, and the laboratories have to be approved by the CPSC to perform the testing. So you can go to the CPSC website and find the laboratories that are approved for the testing. It's global. There are global laboratories on that um, list. And ideally, testing would be performed in the country of manufacture before you ship it and incur those costs, have any problems at the ports bringing the product in. Um, in the U.S., it is mandatory. And the Consumer Product Safety Act also provides Health Canada with the authority to do in inspections. Um, they can inspect the locations where product is being manufactured. They can look for things like good manufacturing practices, cleanliness, child labor even at the factories. Um, they verify that who's producing the product is familiar with the regulations and that they're taking steps to ensure that there's compliance. So look at the factory's quality control procedures. Look at the documentation. Um, so they may at any reasonable time enter the, the place and evaluate the compliance activities. This is new with this act. Um, and for the purposes of varying, verifying compliance, they can do any of these things listed here. The owner or the person in charge and everyone at the facility has to give the inspector reasonable assistance to provide them with products, to um, provide them with the documentation that's required, um, just to help Health Canada inspectors have confidence in the compliance of the product. And Health Canada may certainly take products, send it to a laboratory for testing to confirm. And we talked about um, the, the overall objective of the Canada Consumer Products Act is to improve the health and safety um, of the products in Canada. So from a compliance and enforcement standpoint, there is voluntary compliance, which really is the most effective, it's good business practice. Um, if, if the manufacturer is not going to do voluntary compliance, they can dictate mandatory compliance. Um, there's monetary penalties for non-compliance, and it can even go to the courts. So that's the overview of the Canada Consumer Product Safety Act. Next, we're going to look at the specific promotional product categories and what the specific regulations and requirements are for those. Are there any questions before we get into the next part? Okay. Thank you all again for coming. It's, I know it's early. So, sorry. We're going to look at these overall product categories um, from a promotional product standpoint. So toys and children's products. Toys are one of the most heavily regulated consumer products just on a global basis. Europe has requirements. Australia and New Zealand have requirements. Japan has requirements. Many countries have requirements. Unfortunately, they're all a little bit different, um, of course. The good news is that the U.S. Um, and Canada actually put together a steering committee to look at creating a unified toy standard. I know, thank God. Um, it's got a ways to go because there are some differences um, that are fairly significant and it's going to take, you know, some give and take on both parts. But I, I, I'm thrilled, you know, having been in the industry for decades, I'm thrilled that these two agencies are coming together and looking at a unified standard. In Canada, um, and in the U.S., uh, the toy is a product intended for use by children under 14 years of age. Um, Canada adds in learning or play. So there are applicable regulations to toys. That includes, duh, the toys regulation. And we'll go into some detail that on that. There's also phthalates requirements for certain types of toys. There are requirements for consumer products containing lead and there are additional surface coating materials regulations, all of which may apply to toys. Um, there's also a textiles flammability regulation that may apply to toys made of textiles. Health Canada really has valuable information on their website, and this is from their website, and it's an industry guide to um, children's toys and, and related products. Very valuable, it gives some just concise information about what's required. 
So the toys regulation is looking for various types of hazards. They're looking um, for mechanical hazards. So there's uh, some use and abuse tests. What's a child going to do with the toy? They're going to drop it. They're going to pull. Um, they're going to twist. So there's different types of use and abuse tests related to the mechanical properties of the toy. And then we're looking, as a result of those tests, which is the foreseeable use of the product by the child, we're looking for hazards like suffocation. Very thin plastic bags, for example, can cause suffocation, so there's some specific requirements in the toys regulation for plastic bags. Um, strangulation, small parts choking. This is a picture of the small parts test cylinder. And the same cylinder is used globally for every country that has a toy standard, but Health Canada has taken it a step further and they use a one pound load to determine if the component's gonna fit completely in the cylinder. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that's probably gonna be one of the sticking points in a unified um, toys regulation. But I think it makes a lot of sense. If you have a borderline product or you have a product that's very pliable, it could certainly fit in a child's mouth. One pound force is not significant. Um, and we're also looking at sharp points, puncture hazards. Um, there's a limit on the sound level. Um, to prevent hearing damage. So there's a lot of mechanical requirements. In addition, there's flammability requirements with some very stringent requirements for textile materials, so like plush toys. We're looking at microbiological hazards, and this really applies to liquid-filled items, like a liquid-filled teether. Make sure it doesn't contain pathogens and that it's clean because the liquid could foreseeably um, become accessible. There's requirements for electrical hazards, for battery-operated toys, for thermal hazards, overheating. And there's some stuffing material requirements. And specifically in these three provinces, a stuffed toy, a plush item, has to be registered in these products. And then there's labeling required. So would a, we manufacture plastic glasses. So would a small juice glass be classified as a toy on kids side? It wouldn't be classified as a toy, but it could certainly, depend, based on the size, be considered a children's product. And Health Canada doesn't have specific regulations for children's products, but they will apply appropriate parts of the toys regulation to it. So your plastic cup, you'd want to make sure it doesn't shatter when it's broken. You want to make sure there's no sharp points. Like sometimes on the plastic cups, we'll see like at the mold gate area, there's a sharp point on the bottom. Um, then you also, of course, there's that, the lead requirement that we're going to talk about because the plastic cup would be in contact with the mouth. So it has to um, not contain excess lead. It has to be safe for food contact. That lead, lead contact will be the same for adults. Correct. 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 So, but they will take applicable re sections of the toy standard and apply it to children's products. So, so would, a, would a product like a USB be classified as a kid's product? A USB drive? Yes. Yeah. Not unless there's something that truly makes it not only appealing to children, but something that an adult would probably not use. Yeah, but it's not just, it's not primarily intended, yeah. So that would be more of a general use item. Again, unless there was something funky about it, like if it was a car, maybe. Um, or, a Kayla? Door, or a door or the Explorer attachment or something along those lines, and the adults not going to use that. No. Right. That's a great question, though, because in the U.S., there are specific requirements for children's products that are separate from the specific requirements for toys. But in Health Canada, they, they kind of do would apply toys requirements to children's products as applicable. So another example might be if you're decorating it, if you're painting it on the outside, you'd need to meet the toxicity requirements um, for toys, along with the surface coatings regulations. So there are toxicological hazards that are addressed by the toys regulation. Um, essentially, the 
materials cannot be considered um, hazardous. There are specific toxic substances that are looked at. So one is heavy metals, the surface coatings, the painted decorations on toys um, are evaluated for total lead. They're evaluated for soluble amounts of antimony, arsenic, cadmium, selenium, barium, um, and they're also evaluated for total mercury. This is another major difference between the U.S. and the um, Canada toy requirements. The U.S. evaluates a total of eight heavy metals, but it's a different test method. So from a testing laboratory standpoint, if we get a product to test for compliance to U.S. and Canada, we have to do two separate heavy metals analyses because the test methods themselves are different. And there are also certain chemicals that are just simply banned to use in children's products. And then there are specific labeling requirements. We talked about the suffocation hazards of poly bags. There's specific labeling that you need on the poly bags. Um, all warning statements have to be in both French and English. For the province of Quebec, everything has to be in French as well as English. Um, and there is a, just a general, a federal labeling requirement that we're gonna talk at at the end that applies to all products. If you have a toy that's made of um, PVC material or a child care article, so something that's intended to facilitate relaxation, sleep, feeding for a child under four years of age, there are um, restrictions on phthalates that can be used in the product. So phthalates is a chemical that's added to plastic to make it more pliable. Um, there are six phthalates that are restricted for use in toys in Canada and, ch and child care articles. The same six are currently um, restricted in the U.S. They're restricted in Europe. The U.S. phthalate requirements are changing, um, but these are the common phthalates that are um, regulated for children's products. And this falls under, again, the phthalates regulation. It's not specifically part of the toys regulation. Then we have the consumer products containing lead, the contact with mouth regulations. And as we mentioned, this applies to any consumer product um, that could be used with the mouth. So the cups, um, it could be whistles, it could be anything that's intended for use with the mouth, for use in the mouth. Um, and it also applies to toys for children under three years of age. And this is a requirement for the substrate material. The accessible substrate materials um, cannot contain more than 90 milligrams per kilogram of total lead. So this is different from the, um, so from the surface coating requirements in the toys regulation. This is additional. The substrate materials also cannot contain lead if it's something intended to be used in the mouth. And this does include things like crayons and chalk and modeling clay. Um, because those are considered foreseeable to, that a child would put it in the mouth. Then there's surface coating regulations. And the, we talked about the toys regulation, and it does include those um, limits on certain heavy metals in surface coating. This expands beyond just the toys. It would apply to things like liquid paint, gel, um, surf other surface coatings in arts and crafts material, and there's a limit for total lead and also total mercury. So this just expands beyond the heavy metals in the toys regulation. So those are the regulations applicable mostly to toys and children's products, but also to other types of consumer products. Um, apparel is the next category we're going to talk about. There's been a flammability um, regulation in Canada since 1971. It is essentially s the same as the U.S., um, but Canada, Canada's regulation is expanded beyond just wearing apparel. It really includes all consumer products made of textile materials, so like fabrics and drapes and things like that, um, unless it's regulated elsewhere. So, for example, there are specific separate regulations for children's sleepwear, for tents, for other textile materials. 
But the requirement is that there's a limit on the time of flame spread. You can't have something that burns quickly um, because that presents an unreasonable hazard. There's also care labeling requirements. You have to have appropriate washing and other care instructions. And um, under the Textile Labeling Act, the fiber content has to be listed and it has to be accurate, um, plus or minus 5% with some other details. Um, so this is all very similar, essentially the same as the US. So from a testing standpoint, you could test it once and meet both of the requirements. Um, Canada does also have a ban on TRIS, which is a flame retardant. Um, this has been a hot topic recently, and more and more U.S. states are banning the, the TRIS as well. And um, so Canada has already taken that action. So those are the regulations. These are the mandatory requirements for your apparel. Then there's other things to consider um, that may be more quality related. How strong is your fabric? Um, how does it look after you wash it? Is there a lot of pilling? What about color fastness? Is that um, red scarf going to uh, release the dye onto the wearer's neck? So there's a lot of other tests that can be performed on apparel from a quality standpoint. Um, we do look at, Canada does, does look at drawstrings, as does the U.S., um, that it is a substantial product hazard. There have been incidents of children um, getting the drawstrings caught, for example, going down the slides and, and causing strangulation. And there's also been incidents of vehicular dragging, where like the drawstrings would get caught in the bus door and the bus takes off. So for these reasons, drawstrings are regulated and banned in some products and um, have minimum si maximum length requirements in other products. So something to consider. If you're making a children's product, just don't include drawstrings. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Yeah, it is. And you know what amazes me is that I feel like every week there's another recall for a children's product with drawstrings. You don't even have to test for it. You can just look at it. <laughs> So it is easy. Would there be any regulations for, uh, you know, like people package a product in a, in a, in a, in a non-woven bag or a, or a velvet bag with a drawstring? Uh, you could package, for example, a, a stainless steel bottle or, right. or a ceramic mug or something like that in a drawstring. Is there a regulation to that effect at all? There's not. I think that you should if you're doing a children's product, you could consider the potential strangulation of even the packaging, um, but there's not a regulation for the general use items that you described. Um, so moving on to houseware and drinkware, we talked about the consumer products containing lead regulation. So um, no more than 90 milligrams per kilogram of total lead is allowed. Um, there's also, for ceramic mugs and other glassware, there's a glazed ceramic and glassware regulation. And this looks at, includes leachability limits. So the concern there is that lead or cadmium could leach out of the mug and contaminate um, the drinking material, the food. Um, there's also a specific requirement for decoration at the rim, so within the top 20 millimeters um, if there's painted decoration. There are also leachability limits for lead and cadmium. And just in general, all the materials have to be safe for food use. So the, the uh, inks which the decorators use, and I'd like to, you to expand a little bit on the ceramics, is that the responsibility of, like if you're buying all the inks from US-based or European, European ink suppliers, uh, and they are giving you tests uh, based on their organic inks and UV inks. So, mm -hmm. so is that, does the responsibility fall on the decorator or does the responsibility falls on the actual logic, the logic ink manufacturer? So if they're providing you test certificates saying that, you know, the lead contract of our ink is below 90 mg for me. Yeah, and if you have confidence in that, you can certainly accept their certifications. Um, it's important that what they're certifying compliance are exactly the same inks that you're going to use on your product. 
Um, so you don't just want a general statement that says, all of our inks meet these requirements. You want to know these inks specific to your product meet the requirements. So you want to have that, that level of traceability. And also you just want to make sure that nothing in the manufacturing process is going to contaminate. Um, I have an example, it's not related to drinkware, but to apparel, where we did wet ink testing um, on the screen print inks that were going to be added to the t-shirt. And wet inks were fine, no tra you know, minimal traces of lead well below the limits. We tested the finished product, scraped the, the screen printing off, and found high levels of lead. It's like, how did that happen? Well, come to find out, with the screen printing, they were cleaning the screens periodically, because they should, with leaded gasoline. And so the first few products that were run after the screen was cleaned contained high levels of lead. So it's an example of where contamination could be added during the manufacturing process. So I think you're doing your due diligence by asking for that ink certification, but then you just also need to make sure that there's nothing in your process that could cause contamination, because ultimately it's the finished product that has to be compliant. There's another example of that. We had a client that received a just a letter from a manufacturer saying that the product did not contain lead. And I said to our client, if I were you, I would not accept that. I would wait to get an actual test report. Well, the manufacturer was not willing to give a test report, so we went ahead and tested it. Now, these beads were supposed to be lead-free, and they came in with, with over a 1,000 parts per million of lead. So we always advise our clients do not accept letters. Ask for the physical test report from the lab so you have your backup documentation showing that, okay, we're under the 90 uh, parts per million of lead or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's a great example. Getting the test report is even better than just getting the certificate. These are the limits um, for the leachable lead and cadmium for the glassware. And you'll see that there's different limits based on the type of product. Um, and we talked about the exterior decora decoration within the top 20 millimeters also being regulated. If you have a ceramic item that's truly not intended for food use, it could be like a decorative plate, you need to label it very clearly that this is not intended for food use, contains lead, contains cadmium. Um, so that labeling is required, both French and English, um, so that a consumer doesn't inadvertently use it. And when we talk about additional considerations for this type of product, you want to look at things like dishwasher and microwave compatibility. If there's a reason that it shouldn't be used in a dishwasher, but it's foreseeable that a consumer would do it, you should label it accordingly. Um, you want to make sure you label if it's not intended to be used in a microwave. Didn't we have some issues with some mugs that contained metal, but it wasn't apparent from just looking at the mug, and we put them in the microwave and there were issues? <laughs> there were issues. <laughs> um, so you just want to make sure, you think about the potential use of the product and then ensure that it's safe for that intended use or label accordingly. You can look at things like lid fit and leakage, um, stain resistance, you know, you don't want a bowl that you put spaghetti in and then it maintain, keeps that stain. I've had that happen with um, plastic in particular. Um, these products in the lower right were recalled, obviously children's products, and what happened is um, when they were dropped, the faces are just glued on, and so they came off and they're small parts. So um, that's a foreseeable use of a children's product, and that's where it would need to be subjected and comply with the drop test. Um, in the middle there, that's a SeaWorld um, sippy cup, and there's liquid inside, so the little dolphins are swimming. That liquid was kerosene. Why would you do that in a children's product? So that was recalled. It is, because it's foreseeable that that liquid could become accessible, and just, I mean, petroleum distillates, kerosene can't be used in a children's product. 
then the top picture, those types of mugs are very popular, the, the water bottles. And just a caution to just ensure that that tip does not detach, because even if it's an adult water bottle, that's going in your mouth, and that could still present a choking hazard. So there have been recalls of water bottles um, with that tip detaching, but they can certainly be made appropriately and be fine. So moving on to writing instruments and art materials. Um, again, the consumer products containing lead applies to crayons and pencils and chalk because it's certainly foreseeable that they're going to go in the mouth, even with grown-ups. You know, you put your pens in your mouth sometimes. Um, the surface coating regulations would apply. And then there's just a general toxicity for art materials. Um, which references the U.S. LAMA requirement. And that just means that the formulation of the art material is reviewed and needs to be non-toxic. And they're taping this, so you'll be able to get a, whole, a copy of this as well as the presentation afterwards. You can just talk to PPPC Chantel. <laughs> Um, additional considerations. There is an ANSI standard for crayons um, that looks at more quality related items. Um, so some crayons will be tested to that. It's not mandatory and it's more quality related. But it helps if you want to say rights as well as Crayola or something. You want to do these types of comparative tests. Um, there's also a British standard that I'm kind of surprised hasn't been adopted elsewhere that deals with the airflow of the pen caps. So you'll see a lot of times the pen caps have like openings around it to help prevent um, constriction of airflow. We would recommend you comply with it even though it's only a British standard. Um, and then you can look at, if, is it an adult item or is it a children's product? And most pens would be considered general use, as likely to be used as adults as by children. But there are certain pens, like those pictured here, that really are kind of children's products. And so you'd want to subject it to the appropriate requirements from the toy standard. Um, electronics and battery operated items. There are industry standards. There's CSA, the Canadian Standards Association, and UL standards for electrical products. There are some specific um, electromagnetic compatibility requirements per Industry Canada for certain types of electrical products. And a big thing is battery accessibility. That's been um, an identified hazard with children and even older adults swallowing batteries, particularly the button cell batteries. And so there are accessibility requirements in the toy standard, but that are recommended for all products. Um, with electrical and battery operated products, they're typically a higher price point, so the quality expectations may be a little higher. So you want to make sure that they're working as intended, that they're not overheating. Um, and again, battery accessibility, Let's just make them inaccessible without the use of a tool. Sorry, I'm rushing a little bit because I know we only have a few more minutes. Um, for jewelry, there are specific children's jewelry regulations under the Canada Consumer Product Safety Act. Um, goes up to 15 years of age, which is kind of interesting because the toys regulation is 14. Um, but there are limits on the amount of total lead and on the amount of migratable lead applies to all accessible components and to all materials. It's not just for metal, for example. There are proposed restrictions for cadmium in the children's jewelry. These are all examples of what may be considered children's jewelry. Um, with the animal brooch, there's really the child's peel. The pendant on the cord came from a vending machine. And based on the design and color, consider those children's jewelry. Um, for adult jewelry, Health Canada does advise in writing, advise industry to avoid the use of lead in all jewelry. It's not mandatorily regulated, but that could certainly be considered a product hazard and a um, reportable incident if you have high levels of lead in jewelry. And then for precious metal, there's specific requirements for the markings. One of the challenges with jewelry is that What's considered jewelry under the regulations really is pretty broad. It's not just what we would consider jewelry, 
but they're also looking at things like key rings and cell phone charms. These cell phone charms were recalled by Health Canada because they had excess lead and they were over the proposed cadmium limit. For bags and luggage, there's really not any specific requirements. If it's, a, if it's a textile bag, you have the flammability requirement. If it's like a lunch bag where there's going to be food contact, it needs to be safe for food use. If it's a children's product, there are certain requirements that would apply. Um, performance is a big issue with the bags. You want to make sure that um, on luggage, that the zippers hold, the wheels survive. So there's various quality and performance tests that you can perform. Um, we talked about for thin plastic bags, there's a mandatory suffocation warning if it's below a certain thickness. You do want to look at cords on bags and consider the intended user of the bags, and maybe you don't want the thin cords on bags intended for young children. And then for the reusable bags, there's concern in the industry about keeping them clean so that you're not um, spreading foodborne illness. Um, cosmetics. Yes. Um, does not fall under the Canada Consumer Product Safety Act. Cosmetics has its own regulation, its own act. It falls under the Canada Food and Drug Act. So the cosmetics have to be clean. You can't have um, unacceptable pathogens in it, mold and yeast. Um, it ha the cosmetics have to include something to help fight off contamination. Um, and then there are specific coloring agents that are considered acceptable for use in cosmetics. Um, there is also a specific cosmetics regulation that addresses heavy metals in cosmetics that includes labeling requirements um, that mandates child-resistant containers for certain types of cosmetics. And there are notification requirements in Health Canada in putting a cosmetic on, a, on the market. Um, temporary tattoos are considered cosmetics and um, good manufacturing practices are required. Cosmetics are a higher risk category because it goes directly on the skin. Um, with cosmetics, some additional concerns could be the packaging. Um, if they're intended for children, there's additional children's product requirements. These Bonnie Bell cosmetics, which are for children, um, came in bags and they were actually recalled by Health Canada because there was excess lead in the metal clasp on the bag. But because they are a children's product, they had the lead restrictions that apply not just to the product but even to the packaging. Um, the hairspray was recalled because it lacked the cautionary statements for um, flammable, that it could be a flammable explosive material. So lastly, I just um, wanted to briefly mention Canada's um, consumer packaging and labeling regulations. There are specific requirements that have to be on the packaging of the product. So you'd hate to ha have gone through all the regulations for the product itself and then find out you have an issue with the packaging. So it's important to take this into consideration. It applies to all prepackaged products. Um, again, French and English is required for most of the verbiage. Um, and required for everything in Quebec. And that is it. Um, any questions? So, uh, what's the requirement you use your ceramic marks? Is mm -hmm. there a requirement by the actual manufacturers to have a label on a ceramic mark that I drink wear on individual items? Not. Country of origin needs to be on the product or the packaging that goes to the consumer because the requirement is that the consumer has to know where the product came from. Okay. A, lot of, a lot of products don't have the, the country of origin at this time. Right. That is part of this um, requirement. On each individual product, it should be there somewhere or the other. Or on the packaging. That's right. And that falls under a different require, different regulation. It's the marking of imported goods regulation, but it is a requirement for consumer and products. The poly bags which we use, which we use for uh, packaging the products, they have to have the children's 
even in small files, are they have to have that safety warning? Or is that the it depends on the thickness of the poly bag as well as the size. So there's specific um, size requirements and, and thickness requirements in the toys regulation. All of these are available on the um, Health Canada site, which is very user friendly. And again, they, they do provide good guidance documents on a lot of these. Yes? I've been told by Health Canada that activity books are considered toys. <laughs> so coloring books with them hang on. Single word. Well, again, with um, because Canada doesn't have specific children's product requirements, they will apply the toys regulations as appropriate to children's products. So I'm not surprised. In the U.S., they could be considered strictly children's product versus toys. Um, but in Canada, because there's not that differentiation, I am not surprised that they're considering them to be toys. It's actually unusual. It looks like that. But you said there's act their activity yeah, books. I think it's the activity that makes it that differentiates it from a typical book that you're just going to read. Yeah. And I mean, I'm thinking from a toxicological standpoint, certainly any crayons and other art materials, typically paper has not been required to be subject to that, but it sounds like you got some insight that they are now requiring that. Let's talk further about that. <laughs> any other questions? Yes. Um, where we get confused at work is, is uh, product that is not intended for three and under. We're still putting the small parts labeling on items, even though they're intended for older children. Is that the way to go? We just feel like it's just a safe card for us, mm -hmm. and but we're getting a little pushback from people with why that's not on this label. This item is not intended for child three and under. But it presents a hazard to children three and under. And so I, I think it's um, not inappropriate to include it if there are some small parts issues. Um, you know, in the U.S., there's some specific small parts warning statement requirements. And it's required if it's for between children three and six and has a small part as received. Canada doesn't have that specific type of regulation, but I think it makes sense if it's for a youngish child, so like six and under, and there are small parts that either are present or that may be released, you know, as a result of testing. I, I don't think it's inappropriate to include it, but it's not mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. And again, this was recorded. It will be available through PPPC. Um, and they have a copy of the presentation as well, so just contact them. All right, thank you. And again, my thanks. And my colleagues are here, and we have a booth, so we're happy to answer any further questions that you might have if you want one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you.